Today we're out here in Southern California taking a look at the all new 2019 QX50. This is arguably going to be Infiniti's most important vehicle in America because they expect this to be the most popular Infiniti in America. For 2019, Infiniti has gone back to the drawing board and completely redesigned the QX50. This shares nothing with the outgoing model. We have an all new platform that is dedicated to high efficiency and high practicality inside the cabin. And under this hood, we have a world's first. It's a four cylinder engine that can mechanically vary its compression ratio. What that means to you as a shopper is that this engine can operate in a mode that optimizes efficiency and it can then switch modes later into a mode that optimizes performance. Up front, the QX50 is instantly recognizable as an Infinity. We have this large and distinctive Infinity grille with a radar sensor right here behind the Infinity logo. We also have full LED headlamps with LED accent strips inside and LED fog lamps lower on the bumper as well. When the compact luxury crossover segment started in America, vehicles tended to fall into two different categories, really as they still do today. Vehicles that are very focused on performance and give up some practicality in the process, most notably things like the BMW X4 or the previous generation QX50. We then had entries that definitely had a solid focus on practicality, like the Volvo XC60 or the Lexus NX and Lexus RX. And this is where the 2019 QX50 has really changed because it has crossed over from the performance dedicated side of this segment onto the practicality dedicated side of this segment. Now, interestingly, that does not mean that the QX50 has grown for 2019. It's actually shrunk at 184.8 inches long. This is about two inches shorter than the outgoing model, even though we have considerably more cargo space in the back. You'll notice that the overall shape and profile has changed too. We have a much square rear end, a little bit more upright back here, and that really helps out the cargo practicality and the rear seat accommodations in the QX50. The role of the compact luxury crossover has been changing over time because the role of the compact luxury sedan has been changing over time. The sedans seem to be focusing on sportier intentions, better driving dynamics, and focusing less on rear passenger room. And that's where the compact luxury crossover has been coming in for people that are interested in cargo capacity and rear passenger accommodations. Out back, the rear end styling is also instantly recognizable as an infinity, but the lines are definitely crisper and sharper than we see in the larger QX60. The tail lamp modules have distinctive light pipes running inside that mirror what's going on up front, twin exhausts down below, and of course, well-integrated parking sensors. While mainstream crossovers seem to be getting lower and lower to the ground every year, ground clearance still seems to be important for luxury compact crossovers. And that's why we find 8.6 inches of ground clearance in the 2019 QX50. That's just about the same as we find in most of the European options. Under the hood, we find the biggest change for 2019. We have a two liter four cylinder turbocharged engine instead of the 3.7 liter naturally aspirated engine that we had in last year's model. And of course, this engine is sitting across the engine bay, not longitudinally in the vehicle, because this is a front wheel drive or all wheel drive vehicle, not rear wheel drive or all wheel drive like the last generation QX50. But what's really interesting under this hood is not the way the engine is oriented, but the engine itself, because this is the world's first variable compression engine. It can change compression ratios from a low of eight to one to a high of 14 to one. You want low compression for high power output, and that's when you want all 268 horsepower that this engine can produce. And you want high compression for higher efficiency situations like just cruising down the freeway. Up to this point, modern engine designs have always been a compromise. You want to choose a compression ratio that works for most of your situations, and you'll change it a little bit based on whether the car you're looking to design is targeting fuel economy or performance, but this engine allows you to do both. That's how this engine manages to produce more horsepower and torque than most entry-level engines in this segment at 268 horsepower and 280 pound-feet of torque, yet it still gets 27 miles per gallon combined, which is class leading. That's about two miles per gallon better than the Audi Q5, which uses a dual clutch transmission to try and get fuel economy that approaches this. It's also more efficient than the base engine in the new Volvo XC60. In fact, if you want to get better fuel economy than this in this particular segment, you will have to get a Lexus NX Hybrid. I'm going to give front seat comfort 9 out of 10 points. These are very comfortable seats in all models of the QX50. Unfortunately, we don't find four-way adjustable lumbar support or extending thigh cushions or inflatable side bolsters, which we do find in some of the luxury competition. And that's what keeps this out of the top 10 out of 10 category. 
However, the overall design of these seats is very, very comfortable. This is an all new seat design for an Infiniti, and they really have gone to extensive lengths in order to make this cushion as comfortable as possible. This is the kind of seat that it would be very easy to sit in for hours and hours on end. Unfortunately, the lack of adjustable lumbar support means that if the lumbar is hitting you in kind of an unusual position, you can't raise it up and down to adjust to drivers of different sizes. We do have a tilt telescopic steering column that is powered and memory linked and of course a two position seat memory right over there on the door. In terms of overall adjustment ability, the front passenger seat has the same range of motion as the driver's seat. Rear passenger comfort is an area where the previous generation QX50 definitely fell behind the competition, but that's not the case for this model. And in fact, this is one of the most comfortable back seats in this category, easily scoring 10 out of 10 points. The seat bottom cushion is not as close to the ground as it is in some of the competition. I still have about an inch of headroom left, even though our model does have the optional panoramic moonroof. And the rear seat legroom is very, very generous. At 38.7 inches of rear legroom, this is class leading. There are also a few additional touches back here to make rear passengers more comfortable. We have a reclining rear seat back with a decent range of motion. This is the most upright position, which you can use to square off the cargo area. And then we have a reclined position, which is more comfortable. And it's worth noting that the recline mechanism is nice and low in the seat back. It doesn't cause the seat back to hit you in a strange place as some reclining seat backs can. The rear seats also slide forward and backward, which allows you to apportion space between the second row and the rear passenger area. That's definitely useful if, for instance, you have kids in the back that don't need the extra legroom, but you want to pack a lot of luggage for a weekend away in the back. If I scoot on over to the right side of the vehicle, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I still have about two to three inches of legroom left. Again, you'll notice a pretty big difference between this and some of the European entries. If I move to the middle seat, it is a little bit higher off the ground than the outboard seating positions, but headroom is still generous. My hair just barely brushes the ceiling in this seating position, but my head does not touch the ceiling. Unlike some of the European options, the rear seats fold in a 60-40 fashion, not a 40-20-40 fashion, and we don't have a ski pass through in the rear seat back. Cargo space and cargo practicality is the big reason that Infiniti moved from a rear wheel drive layout to a front wheel drive layout, because the overall packaging efficiency of the vehicle can be increased when you design a vehicle like this. And that's why the cargo area goes from 18.6 cubic feet, which was definitely on the small end of the category, to 31.1 cubic feet, which is definitely on the upper end of the category. And of course, if you push those second row seats forward, as I said earlier, you can definitely get more luggage in the back of the QX50 than in any of the competition. From this angle, you can see how much more space we get when that second row is pushed forward. And the second row seats can be folded from either the cabin or from the cargo area in the back. Under the cargo area load floor, we find some additional storage space. This is also where we find the tire iron and, of course, the tow hook. And if we lift it up a little bit further, this is where we find the subwoofer in our model because we do have the Bose sound system. And you'll notice there's no spare tire under here. As we look around the cabin, keep in mind that we are in essentially the top end trim, and that's why we have this large panoramic moonroof and, of course, the suede headliner and rear window shades. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts, and we have two-way adjustable headrests. The model that we're driving features semi-aniline leather upholstery. We also have the perforated inserts because, again, these seats are ventilated. They also have that quilted pattern in the middle on the seat back and seat bottom cushions. There's contrasting leather and contrasting stitching on the side as well. When you step inside the QX50's cabin, the first thing you'll really notice is the attention to detail and the fit and finish quality. This is easily the best interior that Infinity has ever made. Since we're in the top end model, the doors are a combination of suede inserts right here. This is actually sort of a navy blue insert right here. We then have leather on top and then leather right here for the middle of the door panels with again more contrasting stitching going on than real wood trim and some metal trim to go with it. That multi-layered design continues onto the dashboard where we find more stitch material for the upper section of the dashboard, more of the suede material insert right there, again, in the navy blue that runs right there from that section on over to the driver's side instrument cluster, more real wood trim, more of this metallic trim, and then more stitched goodness down here for the bulk of the dashboard. And then of course, on the inside of this section, we find more of that suede material right there around the infotainment and navigation system. Speaking of infotainment, we have essentially the same two screen infotainment system that we see in the Q50 and Q60. The upper screen is used for the factory navigation system, certain climate control readouts, and some audio system interaction. We then have a touch screen below that, and this is also where we find physical controls for the climate control system. The lower screen is also a touch screen. This is where you would interact with your Bluetooth phone interface. 
Enter an address for navigating somewhere, points of interest. You can also change certain vehicle settings and adjust the climate control right here in this screen. One of the interesting touches with Infinity's navigation and infotainment system is you can control it via a toggle on the steering wheel as I'm doing right now. You can obviously touch the screen right there, or you can use this control knob that is lower on the dashboard to interact with the system. Below the infotainment screen, we find a storage cubby, two USB inputs, a 12 volt power port, two cup holders, and then this area can be closed off, but obviously not when we have a USB stick right there. We find that infotainment controller that I mentioned earlier. This area is, again, another one of those suede sections. We then have some black finished trim right here, and then some stitched material on either side of that suede. You'll find the engine start-stop button right here and a joystick-style shifter. We pull back for drive, push forward for reverse, and if you want to park, you just hit the P button right there. There's a revised drive mode button that allows us to choose between personal, sport, standard, and eco, an electric parking brake, and automatic brake hold. One of the advantages of the front-wheel drive layout in the QX50 is that we get a very large center console storage cubby. We have a USB charge port, and you can see it is quite deep. You might actually be able to fit a gallon of milk inside. The instrument cluster is a partial LCD design. We have a physical speedometer and tachometer, and in the middle of that we have a multifunction display that gives us readouts like our trip computer information, audio system information, navigation turn-by-turn -turn directions, there's also a digital speedometer, and of course the status of all of the vehicle's active safety systems that we have on this model. We also of course have a gauge that shows us our boost pressure and the status of the variable compression system, in case you wondered. The three-spoke steering wheel is basically the same one that we find on a variety of different Infiniti models. We have sport grips up top, paddle shifters that follow the steering wheel on the back, we have down on the left, and up on the right, of course. On the left side, we find the infotainment controls, including this button and toggle that allows you to control the infotainment system from the steering wheel. Then on the right side of the wheel, we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control system, as well as the pro pilot assist system, which is the semi-autonomous driving system. These two buttons right here allow you to change what you see right there in the instrument cluster. Out on the road, obviously the first thing you're going to notice about the QX50 is the continuously variable transmission under the hood. That's mainly because none of the other entries in this segment use one. That's just as we had expected from Infiniti, of course, because the larger QX60, which is their three-row crossover, also uses a continuously variable transmission. And this transmission is one of the key ways that Infiniti gets to the 27 miles per gallon combined that they're advertising for the 2019 model year. Interestingly enough, CVTs usually have a positive effect on acceleration as well, However, I suspect that this one doesn't really have that same effect because Infiniti has programmed it to imitate an 8-speed automatic. So as you're accelerating up a hill like this, you will feel imitation shift. So it's actually going to let the engine rev up a little bit and then drop the engine back down in terms of RPMs. And overall, that's a little less efficient than just letting a CVT hang out at a particular RPM. In our acceleration test, this model ran from 0 to 60 in 6.5 seconds, which is about the same as the average entry-level turbo engine in this segment. This is a little bit faster than the Lexus NX200T because that does have a little less power than we're seeing right here, but it is slower than the Audi Q5. That is, of course, to be expected because the Q5 delivers very impressive acceleration figures in this segment, as does the new Alfa Romeo Stelvio. We haven't had an opportunity to do any of our usual braking scores, however, I estimate this is going to be pretty average for the mainstream segment, so I'm going to pop that average number right up there above my head. When it comes to overall handling ability, I'm going to give this a B+. This is fairly comparable in terms of overall handling ability and handling dynamics to something like the Lexus NX or the Volvo XC60, or even actually the Audi Q5, because remember, the Audi Q5 has a front-heavy weight bias. It doesn't have a perfect 50-50 weight balance like we find in the BMW and the Mercedes. If you were expecting the QX50 to be more of a Lexus RX-style ride, then you may be a little bit disappointed, because this is definitely as firm as the average entry in this segment. That means that if you're looking for a softer alternative to a Lexus NX, this may not be the right alternative for you. You may want to actually step up into that larger Lexus RX, although a frequent complaint with that model has been the stiffer suspension. You might be wondering why Infiniti chose to tune the QX50 in this way. The simple answer, of course, is that every other entry in the luxury compact crossover segment is tuned very similar to this. So you're really not going to find that much more of a compliant ride in any of the alternatives, except perhaps the Volvo XC60, if you were to get the optional air suspension that does get a little bit softer. 
That's not to say that the ride in this vehicle is harsh or anything. It just means that you are going to feel some of the smaller road imperfections out on the road. This is definitely going to be firmer than the QX60. In terms of overall cabin noise, we obviously haven't had a chance to measure this on our own home test course either, but this is fairly quiet for the segment. We really don't get too much harsh engine noise into the cabin. We get a little bit less of that than we find, for instance, in the Volvo XC60, but this is not as quiet as the Lexus RX. Infiniti has done an excellent job at masking engine noise, even though this doesn't have a balance shaft. And that's because the new variable compression turbo engine actually uses those counterweights inside the engine itself to act as a balance shaft. Infiniti also employs an active torque rod system under the hood, which can be seen as sort of like an active engine mount. Now, Infiniti tells us that unlike most active engine mounts, this active engine mount actually counteracts other vibrations in the body of the vehicle. So it's not just canceling out engine noise, and that's likely why the cabin is fairly quiet. Fuel economy is a little bit difficult to talk about because I haven't been driving this on my daily commute as we have most of the vehicles that we review. However, it seems possible that this should get the 27 miles per gallon claimed. Depending on where we've been driving this vehicle, our fuel economy has ranged from a low of about 19 miles per gallon over about 30 miles of more aggressive winding mountain driving to about 28 miles per gallon in fairly relaxed stop and go traffic and mixed highway driving. That fuel economy is notably higher than the average entry in this segment, even though overall acceleration performance is pretty equal to most of the competition. You can thank the continuously variable transmission and the new engine technology for that. Now on the downside, CVTs have an unusual feel to them, and that is definitely noticeable in this vehicle, because there are times where it feels like there's a little bit of turbo lag, or perhaps the QX50 is heavier than the competition, especially at initial acceleration. I think the most logical reason for that is the continuously variable transmission's gearing. First gear in this vehicle is not nearly as low, for instance, as competition that would use a ZF9 speed automatic transmission, or for instance, the ISIN 8 speed automatic. Those have a much lower effective first gear. A more aggressive first gear ratio obviously helps improve acceleration, and that is noticeable in the zero to 30 times in this vehicle, which seem a little bit behind the mainstream competition. That's something that we've noted out of Nissan and Infiniti continuously variable transmissions in the past. They're generally geared towards improving highway fuel economy, and so the starting ratio tends to be a little bit less aggressive than some of the stepped automatics that this competes with. On the flip side, of course, if you want better fuel economy than this, you will have to get a hybrid. Whether that's an NX or an RX hybrid or one of Volvo's hybrids, you will need to get a hybrid system in order to beat 27 miles per gallon average. The QX50 includes Infiniti's latest barrage of active safety systems, all bundled under one title, Pro Pilot Assist. This is basically the same system that we see in the new Nissan Rogue, taken to the next level with the direct adaptive steering system that we find in the QX50 now. All the usual features are there, from lane keeping assistance to lane departure warning, collision prevention with autonomous braking, and then on top of that, Infiniti adds the ability to steer the vehicle more aggressively than in previous Infiniti generations of their active safety software. Direct adaptive steering also allows the vehicle to basically move the wheels of the car without moving the steering wheel. That may seem odd, but there is a practical application for this. For instance, if you're on a very rough road, in a normal car, the steering wheel would be jerking around, but it won't do that to the same extent in a car with direct adaptive steering. This car can also counteract crosswinds and other highway situations that can be a little bit tiring. The goal is to reduce steering effort and reduce driver effort, but not eliminate it. So this is not an autonomous driving system. This is a semi-autonomous assist system. And although the car is very aggressive at keeping the vehicle centered in the lane line, it will give up if it encounters a situation where it can't see a lane line or if the curve is too aggressive. In addition, if it senses that your hands are not on the wheel anymore, the system will take some progressive steps in order to attract your attention. The first thing it'll do, of course, is start beeping at you, warn you in the heads-up display, warn you in the instrument cluster that you need to put your hands back on the wheel. Then the beeping intensifies, and it will actually apply the brakes fairly sharply to try and jerk you into attention. If everything fails, then the vehicle will actually come to a safe and complete stop in the lane you're already traveling in, and then turn on the hazard lights for you. It won't attempt to clear the lane like some semi-autonomous vehicles can. Overall, out on the road, the QX50 is a very competent entry in this segment. It's not a pulse quickening entry, however, that is important to keep in mind. So if you're looking for something that's faster than six and a half seconds, zero to 60, you will have to look to another brand. If you want a vehicle that handles the best in this segment, you may have to look to a different brand. But if you're the average shopper in this segment, you should definitely give the QX50 a try because this has excellent driving dynamics out on the road for an entry or mid-level trim in the compact luxury segment. And of course, on top of that, we have absolutely class-leading fuel economy. 
For 2019, the price has gone up a little bit. This will start at $36,560 for the base pure model. If you want the Lux trim, that'll be $39,400. That gets you features like the panoramic moonroof on this particular model and the fog lamps below. The next trim level up is the $43,350 essential trim that gets you leather upholstery, the 360 degree camera system, parking sensors, and of course the three zone climate control that we've all seen on this model as well. If you get carried away with options and you fully load your QX50, you'll end up right around $60,000. That's the upper limit for this vehicle. So it is lower than some of the competition. The pricing structure on the QX50 means that this is one of the best values in the luxury compact crossover segment. The base price is about $5,000 lower than the base price on an Audi Q5 or Volvo XC60. Now, feature content does differ between the XC60, the Q5, and the QX50 in that base trim. However, you're still going to pay less for a comparably equipped QX50. Lexus's NX starts at $35,985, so it's about $500 less expensive than this, but we get less standard feature content and the fuel economy isn't as good. The Acura RDX is also a little bit less expensive than the QX50, but it's almost in a different category at the moment. Acura has announced that there will be an all-new 2019 RDX that likely is going to be in the same luxury category as this, but at the moment I would actually place the Acura RDX in sort of a near luxury category that is one notch below the QX50. The way the interior is put together and the luxury trappings inside the RDX's cabin at the moment just aren't to the same level that we find the rest of the luxury competition. You'll obviously have to wait until we can get our hands on the QX50 for a complete week so we can do our in-depth review and tell you how this stacks up against the competition. But at the moment, I could say if you're looking for one of the best values in this segment, the QX50 is definitely it. Also, if you're looking for good performance and excellent fuel economy, this is a startlingly good blend. The amount of power and performance that we find out of this variable compression turbo engine is very compelling, but of course we still have a continuously variable transmission under the hood, and it's not going to be quite as engaging as the traditional automatic that we find in many of the competitors, or the Audi dual clutch transmission that we find under the hood of the Q5. One last thing I'd like to mention before we go again is the interior in the QX50. This is the best interior that Infiniti has ever made, and it definitely is the equal of most trims of the Audi Q5 and even the Volvo XC60. Now you still won't find some features inside this cabin that we do find in the European competition. So we don't have four-way adjustable lumbar support, we don't have extending thigh cushions or massage functionality, but this is less expensive than the European models that would have those features. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2019 QX50. Be sure and hit that subscribe button down there below so you can be updated on all of our latest videos, including the full review of this vehicle when we can get our hands on one for a complete week. In the meantime, be sure to head over to facebook.com slash so you can see what we're driving this week, and head over to patreon.com if you want to support this channel, and I hope you do. I'll see you next week.